Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, I'll just echo what the other speakers have said so far. Thank you so much for coming and participating in this. Uh, we always like to have some, at least as somebody who writes online, I like to have some face-to-face -face exchanges with people. Uh, this LCS article here is still drawing hate mail of all kinds from <laughs> unknown avatars uh, who, who disagree with you. It's nice to have more reasoned conversations with people face-to-face. There was a, um, somebody got, folks are familiar with this, this individual, the unfortunate uh, Bush administration under Secretary of Defense for Policy, and his name escapes me for just a minute. Uh, Douglas Fife, yes. Douglas Fife's book, uh, War and Decision, you can take that for what it is, but he had a great comment in one, one of the pages. He said, you know, the rise of our internet-based online society has made people uh, much less polite. And you see a lot of that. So, all right, I'm not going to speak terribly long on uh, the article itself. You've read it. You're here to ask questions and interact with the speakers, and, and I support that. Um, what I am going to talk about, though, with regard to LCS and survivability and some of the follow-on articles I wrote, kind of falls into three general sets. One, the history of warship development since 1945. How do we get from uh, let me get the next button here that works. Let's see. There we go. How do we get from that uh, black and white photo there at the bottom right? That's in a later guise, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. How do we get from World War II ships to uh, the two LCS platforms that you see above? There is a history there, and it shapes uh, how we should think about smaller combatants. The second part is the physics, and I tried to mention that in the article and about how small ships and, and larger ships compare as far as physical survivability. Merely the size of your ship has an input there. And finally, how the Navy defines survivability is important. The OPNAV in 9070.1, uh, you can look it up online, it came out in September of uh, 2012, is a different way at looking at survivability as a holistic discipline than um, what many of us were used to in the past. It's not just about hit alpha and surviving hit alpha and, and fixing yourself and, and rigging casualty power so that you can continue the mission. Okay, so real quick, the history of the warship since 1945. At the end of World War II, we were left with a whole lot of ships like that black and white photo there. Uh, and the Navy took a hard look at the lessons of the Second World War. Uh, and what they determined was is the real threats at that time coming up were submarines and aircraft, not surface ships. Surface ships were something you could bomb and, and sink uh, before they ever got near your ship. The real threats were the submarine, the aircraft, and of course the emergence uh, based on the kamikaze and some German uh, developments of the guided weapon, uh, with kamikaze being an early example and German guided bombs uh, being another. So the Navy just had to decide what was the ideal warships that they wanted to build in the post-war era. And they came up basically with two. Now, plenty of ships linger. You've all seen pictures of World War II cruisers that got converted to, to fire missiles. We know the battleships uh, remained uh, for a number, you know, for decades and decades afterward as shore bombardment platforms. But when the Navy thought about what kinds of ships it was going to build, it settled on two. The first one was a five to 7,000 ton light cruiser sort of a model. This was going to be the battle group escort. This vessel was going to mount anti-air and anti-submarine weapons. We want to combine the functions of the cruisers that you're familiar with from the Second World War uh, with the destroyers and their weapons. And the second type of, of ship they decided on for the post-war era was the destroyer escort, a dedicated anti-submarine uh, ship that would be able to be a lower end ship, screen convoys, and do that sort of work. At the same time, a lot of stuff happens uh, after World War II that, uh, that continues on to the, to the present day. We got rid of armor. We didn't need armor on ships anymore because, after all, nuclear weapons were going to render uh, ships obsolete if you got hit with one anyhow. And we started putting more and more heavy things farther up on the ship. We had more radars, more communications equipment. Uh, fire control systems, etc. This increased the weight above the main deck significantly, and it led the Navy to adopt lighter weight building materials for its ships and to dispense with armored gun mounts and, and other such 
uh, features that you saw in, in, in pre-war ships. This development continued and the Navy even called these new ships eventually frigates. Uh, the larger ship was called a frigate for a long time, the DLG, uh, Destroyer Leader Guided Missile. Uh, and that would have been the type of warship you would have been familiar with uh, in the early uh, Cold War era. We later renamed these things cruisers because we decommissioned all of the uh, World War II conversion variants and there was a concern that the Navy didn't have cruisers anymore. But at the same time, as long as the bigger ship continued to develop, so did the smaller ship, the frigate design. And there are a whole series of frigates. You're probably familiar with the, destroyer, the standard destroyer escort from the Second World War. It's a very small ship. Everybody grew in this period. And eventually they all grew up to what you see up here. And that's the uh, Perry class frigate, which is sort of the ultimate uh, post-war escort ship that was actually designed for the lower end escort mission. Now, we tend to think of the Perry as a much more capable warship uh, in the post -cold, end of the Cold War and post-Cold War period before they took its Mark 13 missile launcher off. But it was seen as the upper limit of the escort fleet at the time. Now, the problem became at the end of the Cold War is that the requirement for an open ocean escort sort of went away. And we didn't need that escort capability anymore, at least that wasn't one of the requirements. So the Perry continued on in, in a variety of very useful roles up until the present day when it's finally retiring. What's the point of this little lecture here about the history of post-1945 warship development? It's based on requirements. The requirements change over the course of history and just because we had a destroyer or we had a frigate in one decade doesn't necessarily mean that we need one in the next decade because we don't build necessarily to replace ships. We build to a set of requirements. So that's the Navy's requirement, uh, deployed forward commander's requirements. We don't build to just replace these ships. So that's the first part, that it's difficult to compare the LCSs that are based on a requirement with these previous classes of ships that were also based on requirements, but different requirements. The second point I want to add is about physics. Uh, who here, anybody here take lots of physics? Our engineer, I'm sure did, had, had plenty and others. Anybody here go to damage control school in Newport as a SWO? Okay, some of you have been to Shondland Hall and other places. Okay, they'll teach you a lot about what it takes to keep your ship afloat and what will cause your ship to sink. And your ship's physical length and its physical size is a big determinant in that. You can only get so much survivability out of a ship that is under 3,000 tons and under 400 feet long. There's something called floodable length. If we flood so much of your ship's hull length, you will sink one way or the other. And if you're a longer ship, there's more floodable length to fill up in order for you to, to go down. So just the physical size of your ship plays a role in keeping you afloat. Those who are bigger have a little bit longer. Now you can argue that different weapon sizes can cause bigger holes and cause your, your ship to flood more rapidly. But physics is a big determinant in keeping you afloat. And finally, I encourage people, if you're interested in the survivability of ships, to read the Navy's instruction, OPNAVANCE 9070.1. It divides, for those of you not familiar with it, it divides the concept of survivability into three disciplines. The first one is susceptibility. That means can the bad guys find me and successfully attack me, actually acquire me and shoot a weapon at me. The second part is vulnerability. And that determinant is if I'm detected, can I decoy the weapon away or can I shoot it down? And finally, the last one is recoverability. That's the one that most people are familiar with. If you get hit, can I do damage control? Can I do um, casualty power? Can I make my ship able to, you know, to move and fight again? And I think a lot of people, when they think about the survivability of a ship, tend to only think about the third part. Not everybody, but a lot of people do. And those are, that's, this is the ethos that, that led to those articles. I think the comparisons between LCS and some of these other ships 
uh, are not fair. And that's what led me to write the article in the first place. The FFG7 was produced in a different time for a different set of requirements, and it joined a very different Navy uh, than the Navy of the present day that LCS is joining. When the Perry-class frigates joined, they were an extremely capable warship. Um, they joined a Navy that contained the DDG-2 and the DDG-37 classes. And these were guided missile destroyers specifically designed with, a, with an air warfare mission. And they had a magazine, one of those spindle magazines, if you're familiar with the Perry, the Mark 13 launcher, of 40 rounds. Now, the Perry had 44. And the Perry had a reasonably good... Uh, medium capability AA system, and when you put a Sea Whiz on there as well, it was a fairly capable warship. And the Perrys were entering the fleet before the uh, CG-47s were. So it was a different fleet and a different time. Let me just leave you with this. Every warship is a compromise of, of factors. Weight, uh, armament, armor if you bother to put any on, fuel, uh, even personnel and stores. And designers have to work within all these. LCS is especially challenging because it's modular, and therefore the weight restrictions are much tighter. So, rather, as I said, rather than go over and discuss the article in detail, I wanted to give you some of the background about why I wrote um, the survivability article, and then the two follow-ons, fit to be a frigate and uh, uh, LCS versus the Danish Ivor Hootfeldt. And as I said, I'm still getting hate mail for that. Um, but I look forward to, to answering your questions about this. It's good that you're here. As I said, I, I enjoy face-to-face -face exchanges. Uh, I'm a military history PhD student. I teach a lot of world history and um, American history and Western Civ classes. And my usual audience is a bit more sullen. Sometimes they wear pajamas to class. And they're not terribly interested in the subject. So I welcome your questions. Thank you. Chris, exactly. Some of it, the speed requirement <clears throat> is unique. That's that's a hard one because so much. If you if you've studied this and, and read this a little bit, if you invest, you can you can get a certain amount of speed for a reasonable weight cost in your ship. You can get 28 knots. But if you want 32, and especially if you want 45, you have to invest a lot more. I mean, the, the curve substantially increases as far as your cost and, and the weight concern. Um, I haven't specifically looked at that, Chris. Uh, I know a number of people have suggested, though, that the, the LCS speed requirement uh, was, was not a good thing. And we ought to dispense with it, especially in the frigate design that they're looking at right now. The hard part with that, I think, once you get a hull that, that's been designed and basically approved, it's kind of hard to make those kind of basic changes without some significant costs. Um, certainly, and the company, as I'm sure, will be happy to, to charge us you know, if we wish to redesign the ship uh, significantly like that. There is some good that has come out of, the, I think, the speed requirement. Um, it was born from Admiral Arthur Sobrowski's original concept of the Street Fighter, uh, which is one of the ancestors of LCS. Uh, Admiral Sobrowski, from all accounts, was a very persuasive individual, and it was very hard to say no to him. He was very good at persuading people to believe in his ideas. So, and this is, this is one of his ideas that stuck in the LCS was the high speed and the ability you know, to engage with enemy coastal combatants. Um, Today, though, I think the speed requirement is good. It may allow LCS to reposition rapidly away uh, from its area for whatever purpose. If we employ LCS in what the um, chief of naval operations and what uh, the boss of surface warfare is calling distributive lethality, uh, if LCS launches uh, a salvo of missiles, the high speed may allow it to reposition rapidly and create a larger area of uncertainty uh, for an opponent to respond to. That may be one way it's useful. Actually, we're going to just press the... Yes, sir. You said that uh, we build to <clears throat> requirements, not to replacements. Mm -hmm. And that certainly, everyone would agree, should be what happens. We should build to strategy, we should build to requirements. But 
too often it seems like we're projecting the past into the future. To what degree do you think the Navy actually does in its fleet design and its forward planning uh, build to requirements? And to what degree do you think the Navy is guilty to building replacement and looking back? I think they, they have looked backwards in the past. I think in, in some recent years they've made an attempt to look forward, but it, it hasn't been so successful. Some of you may be familiar with what we used to call the SC-21 family of ships. Uh, this was going to be a very, it was represented by what uh, the USS Zumwalt has become. Very stealthy, uh, mostly very large ships. And these ships were going to replace uh, the CG-47s, the DDG-51s, and be the Navy of the 21st century. Very stealthy, very sleek. Uh, probably commanded by more people with names like Captain Kirk, so that you can be especially uh, modern. Um, this fleet of the future fell on the rocks, and, and like so many other great concepts, it just never came through to fruition, partially because of budgets, partially because I think of immature technologies that weren't ready for prime time yet, that the Navy hoped that industry would, would move forward. I think there was a hope that industry would uh, would replicate the telecommunications industry and leap forward. We we're going to, you know, a great leap forward ahead. And it didn't quite happen. Um, I think in, in the past, maybe we do look backwards in, in some ways. But I think they're trying to look forward. Modularity is something that looks forward. We may have not gotten it perfectly right yet here uh, with LCS, but I think you're going to see more of that. I think the other bottom line, too, is we're going to consistently see less money available. We've got a lot of stiff competition out there. There's the service to the debt. Uh, there is a, uh, a growing sort of welfare state that, you know, there's arguing about whether it should go forward or not. But over the history of the Cold War, that's gradually increased. Even Ronald Reagan only rolled it back a bit. We're going to see less money. We have to work well with what we have. We're going to see less crew on ships. I think they're going to be forced to look ahead, uh, even more so than what they've done already. Perhaps they've looked back when thinking about fighting, you know, some Soviet threat and not looking forward, that's probably true. And uh, we need to avoid that and keep looking forward. And I think we're going to be forced to do it now, hopefully. Thank you, sir. Back, back there. No, that, that's a very good question. There's a whole school of thought out there that suggests that we should dispense with larger vessels altogether. If you look up and read uh, the new Navy fighting machine by Captain Wayne Hughes and a number of his uh, fellow thinkers in various places, it was sponsored by Office of Net Assessment, dates from 2009. You can read that online. Um, in that model, we dispense with larger ships altogether, and we replace them with uh, a a mass of smaller single mission ships, and this is designed to be more, um, more cost effective. That may be, but the problem that you run into, that I've asked Captain Hughes to explain, and he hasn't quite ever explained it yet, is this massive ship has to be based someplace, and you have to get bases for them. They're all fairly short-ranged, and anybody who served overseas in Japan and and places like that knows that, that foreign governments aren't necessarily happy always to host lots of American sailors and their dependents and all the other stuff that Americans bring with them. So there's some political issues there about moving large numbers of even smaller ships. You're still probably going to have a large number of Americans living there, maybe more so uh, than before. The other problem is how do you supply all these small ships? How do you keep them at sea for long periods? Smaller ships have um, less endurance than bigger ones. They're more susceptible to weather, you know, geographically dependent. Um, the best paper that I think you can read on this that explains why LCS grew, at least by one of its 
creators, so to speak, is Secretary Bob Work's uh, piece. It was a Naval War College occasional paper. It got pulled. Uh, but you can still find it on uh, the Aviation Weekly site. Look up Bob Work LCS. And he, he calls it how we got here. And Work sort of details the process by which LCS grew. And LCS uh, grew out of the Street Fighter concept. Street Fighter was going to go in alongside bigger ships. And then this looked good. And as I said, Admiral Sobrowski was a very tough thinker and was very forceful about getting his ideas in front of people and was a very persuasive man as well. Unfortunately, the requirements process interceded. And at this, as, as LCS continued to develop from Street Fighter, we figured out that we needed to replace uh, the aging PCs, the aging minesweepers, uh, mine countermeasure ships, uh, and the aging FF now no G7 class ships. So the requirements process intervened and the ships grew as a result of the requirements process. So I think there's, there's some historical growth. LCS grew to take on these other roles. And that explains at least uh, the growth part. Uh, as far as the cost, you know, there are a lot of reasons that, that ship costs uh, increase. One of the problems I've learned recently about LCS is it has a very Byzantine testing process. Every combination of C-frame and ship and um, mission package, no matter, it, it has to be tested each time. It has to go through a full series of DOT and E-testing. And that slowed down. Uh, the process. I, as I said before, I think we've introduced a lot of immature technology, technology we hoped would, would leap ahead. And I've made this answer a lot longer, and I'm sorry. Um, okay, very good. Thank you. I'm, I'll be around to ask questions afterward. Thank you.